and um, I hope that the lesson notes indicate to you that, that I take what I do very seriously and I spend an awful lot of time on the notes and um, because our time together here is very brief but notes can last you a long time just at your kitchen table and in your own private devotions and so men hardly ever do this you know um, I don't know very many men that pass out notes except at extended Bible studies and stuff but I always do and um, it, it helps me to stay on track um, and I I want it to stay with you for a long time. I'm always uh, looking to the Lord for new inspiration and new ideas. I didn't have to look very far, of course, for our theme for this retreat in terms of, of the demands that are on our life today. And you know, I don't want that term demand to necessarily be a negative thing in our life. Because, um, I mean, there are a lot to demand on my life. And um, for the most part, I consider that a privilege, that people would seek me out and ask my counsel or my advice or my opinion on any given subject. And I, I consider it a privilege to max my life out. I mean, seriously, when you, when you think of... What is it all going to mean in the end? What better thing then could we do with our time than just give it all to God? Sometimes I look around, I was sharing with the single woman this morning, sometimes I look around at other things and I think I could do that. But we're talking today about priorities. And there are so many things to choose from. I told you singles that when I graduated from high school, it was really in the dark ages. Most of you weren't even born when I graduated from high school. And there were about three career fields open to women. Nursing, being a school teacher, and being a secretary. Well, the secretary was the only one that you could do with simply a high school education, so that's the one that I chose. And, um, but Today, you can be anything you want. I mean, <laughs> I don't know why what some women would want to be what they do want to be, but it's their choice. Um, Dick and I travel in a large motorhome, and we pull into a lot of these big truck plazas. And it used to be, when we first started traveling, we're in about our 20th year of traveling. When we first started traveling, you'd only see men in truck stops. Not anymore. Lots of ladies drive. Excuse me, lots of women drive 18-wheelers. I don't know if I could classify them as ladies or not, if you get my drift. I don't want to be unkind to them, but it's a rough, tough world. And hanging out in truck stops is not my favorite thing to do, I'll tell you that. We do it because they have a parking lot big enough to accommodate our rig. But all that to say that there are so many choices today. And, and we have to think in terms of the things... I want to do, if we're talking about priorities, which is our subject today, and balancing life's demand, the things that I would like to do, the things I could do, whether I like to do it or not, clean the oven, for instance, you know. <laughs> we don't grow up with a, that is my favorite thing to do. And then the things that I should do, And the things I must do, that's about how it breaks down, isn't it? The things that I could do, the things that I should do, the things I like to do, and the things I must do. So we have to look to the Lord when we organize what I call a priority list, or we establish priorities in our life, because temptation is everywhere. And temptation isn't always sinful. When we're tempted to do something, it doesn't mean that it's a sinful thing, but it might just not be the appropriate thing for our particular slot in life or that particular day of our life. And so as I go through this lesson on um, priorities, there's a lot of things to address. In our own strength, in our own wisdom, it's hard for us to establish a correct priority list 
Another thing that I think I should say at the outset, and it may come up again during the course of the lesson, but our priorities sometimes change on a daily basis. Um, I just lost my mother in May. Uh, my mother, many of you knew her, and she was precious in, in just about every possible way. And um, when my mother became gravely ill about a year ago, and her, her situation was just up and down and up and down, my, my priority list sometimes would change on a daily basis depending on what kind of word I got from California about what her health was like. And so I have dropped everything, three different occasions, every other priority, every other obligation, even teaching obligation, and whip as fast as I could out to California because at that moment, everything else moved down on the scale and she took that number one priority slot for that time. And so you are going to have days like that too where you know the best laid plans just get thrown up in the air because an emergency happens or something very unexpected. Could be something pleasant, could be something very unpleasant. I mean, if somebody phoned you and said you had won a million dollars, that's a very pleasant, unexpected thing that would definitely change your list of priorities for that day. You'd be on the phone the rest of the day telling everybody that you just won a million dollars. And we would all understand that. If you'd had a luncheon date with one of us and uh, you didn't show up, and we waited for two hours and you still hadn't shown up, but once we found out what had happened, hey, it would be all okay. Priorities do change, not necessarily bad. It's like go with the flow, as the expression goes. But if we're going to be women of accomplishment, women of purpose, women with um, a measure of victory in our lives, we have to have some kind of a plan to work from. Because our, our enemy, the devil, will see to it. He's a great time stealer. And uh, we just get sidetracked easily on just little zinged out things that can eat up our time. And, um, you know, there's this old saying that says time is the, is the stuff that life is made of. And you waste enough time and you've wasted a lot. And it's, so it's a serious thing, I believe. Uh, when we talk about priorities. Our whole role in life, priorities differ. Our age in life, priorities are different. Um, when I was 23 and 24, I had little kids. And so, obviously, my priorities at that time were not what they are today. I can't write a priority. You couldn't begin to write one for me. This is a very individual thing. And yet, I feel like it is such a vital thing terms of meeting and balancing the demands that are on our life that I felt it had to be included in this particular uh, retreat. There's a statement in your folder there with this lesson that says priorities are not determined by how important you say something is, but by how easily you are distracted from getting it done. Uh, for most of us, <laughs> eating is a priority. We like food. Food likes us. Um, and so we always seem to find time, except on an extremely tension-filled day, to find time to eat. We do find time to eat. We eat in the car, on the run, standing up at the kitchen counter. You know, um, we take it in the bathroom. I, ca I carry my coffee all over the house with me. You know, I'm going from room to room. My coffee cup goes with me. It, why? It's a priority. <laughs> Coffee is life to me. <laughs> Especially in the morning. I mean, immediately upon the opening of the eye, I need the IV drip. What can I say? So I'm, I am almost never derailed from making coffee. In fact, now I have a coffee pot I can set the night before. See, I wake up in the morning, follow the odor to the kitchen. If I wasn't afraid of spilling it in my bed, I'd probably have it on my nightstand. <laughs> this is designed for you to take out of the notebook and put on the refrigerator door. Because I feel like this is very key. I feel like this is a vital lesson for all of us. 
to analyze. You know, just keep a diary for your week. What do I spend my time on? See, and then out, just and let that piece of paper or that diary talk to you. You, from that, will emerge maybe some very surprising priorities in your life. And I, uh, I just think we need to be serious. You're going to say, Carol, get on with it. But this is time serious. I don't think we have a whole lot of time left between now and when Jesus comes back. It just doesn't seem like it can go on very much longer. So whatever we're going to do in terms of uh, the kingdom or drawing closer to God or making a difference in the, in the little microcosm of world that you live in, it's going to depend upon my priorities. How do I spend my time? I believe that the definition of priority is uh, from two words, prior meaning previous, in advance, say. You don't make up your priorities as you go along in terms of a daily routine or what you hope to accomplish maybe in terms of a week. This is what I'd like to accomplish this week. So we have to get fairly mundane about this, like paper and pencil and number one, number two, number three. See. A lot of women don't want to be tied down to something like that. But then a lot of those women are the kinds of women who have very little done at the end of the day. And everything is closing in on them. And it's, you know, I mean, some things are simple. Write it down. You can't remember everything, and it needs, you need to be methodical. So previously, in advance, you make a decision to do certain things. Order. Previous, order. Priority. So if you just say, I want to be a free spirit, I'll do it when I feel like it. You know, I'm just moved by the moment. It just seemed right. We don't want to look in your refrigerator. We don't want to look under your bed. We don't want to lift the toilet seat, you know. Because we're very seldom moved by the moment. I just felt it was the right thing to do. You know, um, almost everybody has some kind of a uh, to-do list of some sort, except, of course, the free spirits. Um, either a mental one or a written one. And uh, the older I get, the more written everything has to be. <laughs> I mean, I have, I don't know what I would do without stick of notes. You know, it's like wallpaper to me in the kitchen. Wallpaper over my desk. It's just everywhere. I've got to remind myself. I'll ask Nick a question. He'll say, I just told you that. He's getting worried about me, you know. It's just because there's so many things whizzing around in my mind. I have to stop. Write it down. I know that isn't a whole bunch of fun. You don't get a hot flash and a cold chill, honey, by finding the list. But it is the pathway to successful living and balancing the mind and being in the accomplishment. And I think that's what inside all of us, even the free spirits, they want that. All right, big executives happen. You know, they call them daytimers. You know, where am I without my daytimer? You know, that's what they say. Uh, politicians, heads of state have them. They call them an agenda. What's on the agenda? You know, my personal agenda is, and my agenda for the state of uh, Illinois is, and you know, that's their to-do list. Once you select them as your representative or senator or whatever it is, everybody has them. We just call them different things. I just call it a to-do list, or a today list, or this week, or whatever you want to do. But let's let's get serious about a format, a plan. A prior decision, a previous systematic orderly way to get from A to B to C to D. You get the picture. A lot of housewives have the back of an envelope. 
a back of a cash register slip, a charge slip, you know, rip a piece off of a brown paper bag. I don't care what you use, but we need to do it. We need to get there somehow. Getting something done makes room for something else to go on your list. Maybe not that day, but maybe for the next day. I, I think that, I already said that in any given time span, the priorities can change drastically and rapidly. The bottom line of this whole lesson is God insists on being the number one. Whether you choose a, a prayer place or a meditation place or a devotional place, whether it's a place, whether it's a time, whether it's a method, you know, whether you read Our Daily Bread or whether you read um, all kinds of devotional books out there for every day, whatever you do, if you're systematically reading through the Bible, if you're listening to scripture tapes, if you're putting on a worship tape, worshiping with that, on your knees, whatever your format. I am not here to deliver to you a format. Because we're all extremely individual. And what would work for you would seem like chaos to me. What would be okay for me would seem like overdose to you. We all are different. We're at varying levels of spiritual maturity. Some of you are brand new in the Lord. Um, some of you have served the Lord for a long time. I have served the Lord for a long time. That doesn't mean I can do without this. Not at all. Not at all. You know, you never get to the point in the Lord where you graduate from Bible reading. I have my postgraduate course in prayer. I have my certificate. I don't have to pray anymore. Not. It doesn't work that way in the Christian life. In fact, the more you know the Lord and the more precious your walk with the Lord becomes, the more you desire this thing. Because like I talked about last night, it's that relationship that you want maintained to the highest level of intimacy. And so we don't do this because we're earning brownie points and we're putting gold stars on our little chart, our little be good chart. That's very meaningful to God, isn't it? Your husband comes home, sets down in front of you and said, okay, now I have seven minutes of meaningful conversation time. Let's get on with it. I'm setting the stopwatch. <laughs> Don't do me any favors, guy. I mean, if I'm worth seven minutes, get out of here. God is much more gracious than that, though. Than we are. Because he's God. And we're not. But listen, in terms of successful living and not dying of the crazies by three in the afternoon, we gotta have a plan. We gotta have a plan, something that works for us. That causes us to both keep that relationship with God and keep our own temperament and personality holy and righteous and godly and pleasing to the Lord. So that we're not snarling, screaming, yelling, thrashing, gnashing on our teeth, beating on our kids. There's an answer. Isn't there? There's an answer for each one of us. God is a fair God. He has to be number one. God's a God of order. You ever stop to think about that? Even in the creative week, he didn't create a bird until there was something for the bird to land on. Because there's order. God does things in a, in a really orderly way. That, that should be our first clue. <laughs> that God wants us to have lives full of order and accomplishment. But most of all, Peace. I think that's what every one of us wants. We just want, I just want a peaceful life. You know, and we do not live in a peace-filled world. I just counseled a little girl recently who's had a lot of heartbreak in her life. And she's only 18 years old. And I said, just think how much longer I have lived than you have. 
think how much pain I've lived through. Some of the things she was talking about that had brought pain in her life. I said, you don't think I have pain from that very same thing? I love you. I love your family. I felt that pain. I may have felt it in a different way, but I have felt your pain. We're on a pain-filled planet, folks. Death is the only way you get off of it. So in order to be able to live with the pain, deal with the pressure, and keep our poise, we've got to have a plan. That isn't even in my notes. Isn't that good? Write that down, Pat. I don't want to forget that. We have to have a plan. That's what this lesson is all about. God is a God of order. As Christians, we've got to be aware that God has priorities. We're his children. We have to have priorities in our life, not just our own personal priorities. His priorities for us have to be blended in with the priorities we feel are necessary in our life. And somewhere in there, there's room for you. There's room for God. There's room for your family. There's room for um, the church, the body on the earth. God is not an unjust God. He does not make requirements of us that cannot be fulfilled. We have to do our part. When our relationship with the Lord is kept at the top of the priority list, then we are a lot more peace-filled in the middle of an unpeaceful world. And, you know, most people have absolutely no respect for my priority list. Accidents have no respect for my priority list traumas, emergencies. So in and through all of this, weaving and realigning that priority list of the day, God wants us to be women of a common. I think that all of us would agree that the ideal is to start out our day with the Lord, with some kind of attention to prayer and our what is called the personal devotion or our personal prayer time. That's the ideal. Most of, most of my life is not my ideal. Most of our life, my, uh, everyone in this room, because we're talking about the pressure of demands in the world around us, most of our life is not the ideal. It's not what we would like. But we have to, we have to deal with what we have rather than waiting for the ideal to someday come crashing through the clouds and materialize in our kitchen. It's likely not going to happen. Even if you did win a million dollars, it's not going to happen. And so we have to just find a plan that works for us. There's got to be, in the wisdom of God and the wisdom of His Word, and applying your heart to His wisdom, there has to be a plan that works for you. Because if God is shuffled out, everything goes downhill. And we know that. We've lived through that. But we continue to allow it to happen in our life. And it's, we are self-defeating in that. A lot of people who have told me, now I'm not picking on anyone, believe me. And I, I am a person that likes to do a lot of things. But you know, a lot of the women that have told me, Carol, I just don't have time. <laughs> I just really do. I'm just totally maxed out. You know. What are you doing? Well, I'm taking a craft class. And then, you know, my husband said something about my thighs. And so, you know, I'm in an aerobics class. And, uh, you know, my kids, um, they're very interested in swimming. I've got kids in swimming classes. I've got, I've got um, soccer. And, uh, you know, then I've, then I've got to be at the school. You know, I volunteer at our school. And the list goes on. And we pick up things. We pick up baggage. You know, and I don't want anybody's children to be deprived of swimming lessons. And I don't want anybody's children to be deprived of turning out for soccer and stuff like that. But listen, I know that most mothers don't want to say this word. But you have to draw the line. Or nobody is sitting down I want to read you a, a statistic that to me is very scary. Now, I have felt this way for years, and I taught it in a seminar last year, 
and one of my really good friends worked for the school district, and she was talking to a school district psychologist, totally non-Christian woman, about my theory. And the woman said, that isn't a theory, that's a fact. Because I have a great concern about families not being families, just being a whole bunch of people on different schedules that live under the same roof. And I think mealtime, in the Word of God, breaking bread together was a very important thing. And it was, it was significant. It is not significant in mainline America. Listen to this statistic. The number one indicator that a child is at risk to become an abuser of drugs or alcohol is that his or her family does not eat meals together. The number one indicator, this is from a secular person, not a Christian psychologist. This is from the drug prevention psychologist for the Ferndale Public School District, Ferndale, Washington. The number one indicator, if we have maxed our time out to the point where we do not have one meal together as a family, we are two. And there has to be a place at which we draw the line and say, I'm sorry, you have to be home at this time. We're a family. See, we hardly ever say to our children anymore. I mean, I listen to my own daughter talk to my grandchildren. My son-in-law works long hours. She works her hours. They come home, so-and-so's hungry, we'll have this, say, so eat now. So then dinner time comes, a meal time comes, nobody's in the kitchen, nobody's around the table. She's standing at the kitchen counter, one kid is watching Darkwing Duck. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about your family, I'm talking about my family. I'm concerned about my family. I am concerned. Listen, unless we become wise women who start to analyze what are the priorities of my life, what is really important to me, obviously all of us would say, my family is very important, then we better start making it a priority. Prioritizing the family. Yes, he might have something to say about your thighs, but our aerobics class is that important if you haven't got time for the or if it happens to be at 4.30 or 5.30 in the afternoon, and that's the only time you can fit it in, but you're not home for dinner. I mean, let's, let's look at what's at stake here. Is that more important than our family being together for at least one meal a day? They're almost never together at lunch, because they're at school, dad's at work, maybe you're at work. I'm not against that. I was a working mother myself for a lot of years of my life. But we have just got to get back to basics, to understanding. If we don't establish some priorities, I'll tell you what, the devil's, the devil's not interested in establishing priorities for your home and family. The devil is interested in keeping you so busy, you don't have time to change. You're too tired. I can't make it. I'm exhausted. I have drugged my body to church on a Wednesday night, and I, I live on church I was so tired, I didn't think I could make it down the hill at that moment. But after I got there, and I met the Holy Spirit there, because He is where they're assembled. Where two or three are gathered, I'm in the midst. And I was so refreshed by the time that service was over, I stood around and visited another hour! My parents used to say, do we always have to be the last ones to leave the church? They could go home any time. We lived on the property. But they didn't stay around. Why? Their friends are there. Our friends are our priorities. Right? All that to say, there has to be an answer. Every, I don't know anybody that isn't overloaded. I don't know anybody that isn't dealing with more than they have time for. So your case is not that special, sweetheart. And neither is mine. Listen, I've seen a lot of casualties in the last couple of years. A lot of them. 
Like I said last night, people that I thought would be married to are even married and aren't certain. And I would hate to think that anyone in this would end up Those people didn't plan to backslide. They didn't plan to divorce. They didn't plan adulterous relationships. But once the priorities start going crazy, then you can go anywhere. You can go any direction unless you have absence. That's the trouble. Are there any absence? Even the people of God. It used to be. Listen to me, please. It used to be that there wouldn't be a Christian alive that would work. Out. When I was a little girl, nothing was open on Sunday. Sunday was a day of rest. You couldn't even buy a loaf of bread on Of course, that was before 7-Eleven and Circle K. You know, we use it. What a novel idea. Then the day was the past. We didn't have a zillion and one distractions like there are today. But see, some things don't change with that. Something doesn't change because you have television 24 hours a day and MTV 24 hours a day and videos that you can't make it to the theater you can rent it and bring it home and you can watch it at 4 in the morning if you want to. It doesn't make any difference. You can watch it all night long if you want to. There's so many options open. So many selections that you choose from. That our circuits are overloaded. Our senses are dull to be able to determine between good and evil because we're so overstimulated and overchallenged. And then people bring guilt on you. I just got a letter from a, from a girl in God that I love with all my heart. And I'm going to see her soon, and she and I are going to sit down for a long talk. She wrote me this letter. Sweet letter. She's looking forward to my visit. But she said, you know, next year my youngest goes into school, and now I'm wondering, what should I do with my son? What about staying home? She said, my family is pressuring me to go back to school and get my education. What about just being a wife and a mother? What about just beautifying your home? She doesn't financially have to work. Why does she have to go back to school? We're so hung up on some of these things. Is God pressuring you? I seriously doubt it. What is pressure? It's society. Pushing, shoving, pressuring us into its mold. Rather than the Holy Spirit dealing with us one on one and pressuring us and challenging us to be what this book says for the most part. I seriously doubt that we can handle in a 24-hour time span, handle successfully more than four or five. And if we've got 10 or 15 things that we're doing in a week, it's called masochism. You're punishing yourself. You're, you're inflicting pain upon yourself. Because life actually you reduce it all down, honey. You shake all the dust off, and it reduces to about four or five very simple things. We have by adding a whole bunch of other things. We all have different priorities, except for number one. Love the Lord your God with all with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. This isn't a suggestion. This is a commandment. Are we people of God who obey the commands of God? He has to be the number one priority. As I mentioned before, priorities change. They shift. Emergencies arise. Yes, we talked about that. Everything else goes to the bottom of the list when one of those emergencies arrives. Will God be left out of one of my days? 
top of it. Speaking very realistically, probably, we're praying in the shower, we're singing scripture songs because we have the tape in the car and we're doing it on the way to work and we're praising and we're worshiping. We listen to, you can buy tapes of the scripture, you can put that in your car tape deck and you can listen to that. It isn't the same as you on your knees communicating with God. That's ideal. Few of us, speaking realistically, are able to live the ideal of our life anymore. Simply because of what the theme of this is, the demands that are on us these days. But sometimes we have royally shot ourselves in the foot by allowing demands to be made on us that neither God or our husband or our family have to do. We have placed those demands on ourselves. The secret is you cannot let very many days in a row like that. If that becomes the norm, maybe no time for God, no time for contemplation, no time for meditation, no time for exaltation of our Lord and Savior. Everything pressured, pressured, pressured. Noise, background, music to our life, see, everything, whether, whether it is music, whether it's the television, whether it's the tape deck, even if it's spiritual songs and hymns, the one thing that is lacking on this planet is silence. People get very uncomfortable in silence. You have a pause in any kind of a meeting, and people say, did she forget what she was going to say? What's wrong? Something go wrong with the mic? We are a generation that is very uncomfortable with silence. How can we hear the voice of God with all the time? The priority of just sitting with your Bible open and saying, God, show me something from your word. Page, candle, that takes time. And that has to be a priority. At some point in our lives, we have to intersect with God. Or we're going to become a very negative example. Whether it's physical breakdown, whether it's emotional breakdown, whether it's in our marriage, our home life, we're going to have trouble on the job. Hey, listen, if your circuits are overloaded, if you run on overload for very long, then you can't run even that thing on overload for very long, and it's going to blow We're not super. We are not. We are made in a flesh and blood body that has limitations. We don't like to admit that, but we have them. We live on overnight for just a little while. And I'd rather get serious about a priority than inflict that on me. become a negative. And I know you do. Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus said, watch out. Be on your guard. Against what? Against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of I don't have to interpret that for you. I don't have to tell you what that says. That says what it says. We just don't want to adapt to what it says. So you don't have the current color. So you don't have the newest car. So you don't have this. You don't have that. Where are your priorities? In the abundance of things, the newest style, the newest this, the newest that. Is that your main is peace, calmness, this old-fashioned word called serenity. How many totally serenity-filled moments have you had in the last two weeks, 30-day period, six weeks? 
See, we've got to get serious about this. I can't do it for you. I can't program you, push your buttons, and make you learn how to say, no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. I'd love to be with you, but, you know, we just haven't had any time. I've got to have some space. Now, see, listen to me. What's happened in the church today is that people are maxed. I told you that. We don't know anybody that's not maxed. We don't know anybody that's sitting around thinking of, saying, what can I do now? I've got a thing to do. Oh, man, I'm so bored. It's not there. It's not anywhere in our society, folks. It might be in the old folks' home, but it is nowhere else, believe me. So people think, I'm maxed. We've got to have family time. We haven't had a family night. We're maxed out. Friday night's busy. Saturday night's busy. Well, I guess we better stay home from church on Wednesday night. Because we can have And you know what's happening today? A lot of churches are not even having midweek because no one's showing up. Because people are too busy for God. And when we're too busy for God, honey, there ain't no hesitation for me to say you are flat out too busy. And you better drop something. He insists on doing the miracle. And he will, I'm not kidding you, he'll start rearranging your schedule. He will make you hurt. I don't, I don't want to scare anybody. I am being as realistic and honest with you as I know how to be. Because I feel that's my responsibility before God. But I have watched too many things go down the tube. Because so-and-so was in soccer, and she was in ballet, and she was in aerobics, and we are taking swimming lessons, and we are doing this. None of those things are sinful in and of themselves. But if they dominate the priority list, and he doesn't, something is big time wrong. And I'm not talking about society out there. I don't even know what those lives are like. I'm talking about the church. Because I know a lot I know a lot about what's going on in the church today. And it breaks my heart. Because we are worshiping family, and we are worshiping sports, and we are worshiping occasions, and we are worshiping track meets, and we are worshiping a ballet performance. I don't, I don't think things are sinful in and of themselves. He is the Lord. And if we don't get back to some kind of order in our lives so that he is the preeminent one and that he rules and reigns in our scheduling of our time, if we don't teach our kids, listen, yes, I want you to succeed and yes, I want you to be a well-rounded person, but our family is a Christian family. And there's certain things that a Christian family has got to have time for. I mean, I don't live on another planet. I have grandkids. I have sons-in-law, daughters-in-law. Listen, I know what life is all about. But who's in charge? See, somebody's got to be in charge. There has to be a godly mom and dad that are saying, Yes, there's no sin in there. There's no sin. But see, we only have a certain number of hours in a day. We only have a certain number of days in a week. And we have no time for God. Or guess what, folks? We're going to see you. We might be a bunch of people that have all of their beds in the same house. Mutual respect and exchange, conversation, and time of serenity. Not just in church, in our homes. Peace in our homes. What a novel idea. Peace amongst siblings. Kind words. 
I, I care a lot about the kinds of slang. And I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the, in the families that belong to churches in our church. The slang. The, the caustic language, the names that they call each other, the way they demean each other, cut, cutting on each other. What does the Word of God say? Words are like arrows. They go deep into the belly. I'm talking about priorities. Because if we don't get back to some kind of priority in Christian homes, what chance is there for us to impact the world? See, there's darkness and there's light. And if the light starts absorbing so much darkness, it ceases to be light, right? And then the whole world. We don't want that to happen. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? We start by changing ourselves. Changing our priorities. Making a difference in our church. Being a vital part of our church. Not just someone that shows up when we don't have anything else to do. When it's convenient. These are the last days. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, with I was with the single, and I talked about these are the last days. It has to be. How can it be? How can it get worse than a 15-year-old in California who is suspected of killing that tourist? having a rap sheet with 53 arrests on it. And the kid is still out loose on the street. Well, back to the Bible. Back to square one. Back to the beginning place. For us, the kid. For the people of God, the world's not going to get back. The world is sure not going to get back to the Bible if the church doesn't get back. That's all I'm saying. Let's remind each other of this. No one has any more time than anyone else. We all have seven days in one week. Each one of us have 24 hours in one day. That's it. Nobody has an edge on anybody else. Oh, but you have more time than I do. No, not. I have 24 hours. You have 24 How we allocate those 24 hours that make the And yes, it is complicated by larger families, but there are other things besides family that eat up our time. So you might have six kids, I don't have any. Does that mean I have more time than you? No. I have obligations you've never even heard of yet. You have obligations I don't have, but I have some that you don't have. It all shakes down to. We're just about, all of us, just barely keeping our nose about the bottom. Because people won't let you be idle anymore. Just about this girl, like this girl that I got to know. What, what about just staying home? What about just being a mom? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with just being there when your kids come home from school? How antiquated, but I think it would be very healthy for her and for the kids. She's had all this time with kids at home. No kids at home now. Now what I see, I the mode, the modus operandi in our life is I must do this. See how many things we can do. How close to the edge we can. Do. How little amount of sleep we can get by and still stay sane and still stay healthy. I don't think it's God's plan. For When we talk about priorities, we have to talk about how we spend our money. So many women working today, that's why the church has no volunteers, like I mentioned last night, because everybody's working for a living. Why are they working for a living? Because children are demanding more and more of their parents these days in terms of, I won't wear that. 
I never had that liberty myself. I was tickled to death to have clothes to put over a bare body. But now, it's, I don't like that. My mother never asked me if I liked it or not. She bought it, I wore it. End of discussion. It's not that way today. I know, listen to me, I'm smart enough to know that we are not going to change everything overnight. It's not going to be back to Little House on the Prairie, folks, ever. I'm smart enough to know that. I've never been to college, but I do have that one. But listen, we better start going back to some values and some absolute in our lives and in our family. Because Jesus intended that his church make a difference in this world. And we're a part of that church. And we have to very seriously start asking ourselves, am I making any kind of difference in my neighborhood, in my church, on my job? Am I what Jesus calls salt and light? Am I a leavening influence in a very positive way? Because that's what he intends for every one of his believers, every one of his eyes, every one of his so the bottom line is, God insists on being the number one priority. We just have to analyze what is priority for my family, for my life. My priorities, I can't inflict those on you. One of my priorities in my life is, is my ministry of letter writing. And I devote hours to writing, writing letters. That's not a priority for many of you. In fact, I believe that letter writing is a dying art in the United States. We pick up the phone instead. But you know, not everybody can afford long distance phone calls, and so I, I still write letters. And it's very time consuming, it's very demanding, but I feel like it's something that God wants me to do, and so I make time for that. I totally enjoy it. But it is time. Would I like to learn how to do oil painting? Would I like to do macrame? Would I like to learn how to be a better sewer? Would I like to be a better oil painter? I've dabbled in all of those things. I'm not really good at any of them. I can't be! I can't be, because I do. I have, there's, a, there's hardly anything anybody can mention that I wouldn't like to get into. I'm interested in a lot of things. I dabble in a lot of things. I can't get good at any of it. Because I have a list. And I hope that each one of you do too. But let's not make the church suffer because of misaligned priorities. Let's, let's not let the light of the Holy Spirit go out in our lives because we had to go to work because our kids wouldn't settle for anything less than the shack attack finishes. I won't wear that. I bought it for I bought it. I don't plan on taking it back. I mean, if you're having a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old say, I won't wear that. The priority is Never. The children do. But three-year-olds are ruling in the home of the A lot. It's back to God. It's back to the Bible time. It's back to the Bible. It's back to establishing a list of They will vary with every person in the room, except for number one. Number one has got to be the same for every one of us. If we're daughters of God, he has got to be the number one priority. Every time. Listen to me. Everything falls in line. The order of priority. Your cover says that stamp urgent. Everything is urgent these days. Everything's a crisis. Everything's got an expiration date. Everything's got a time limit. 
do this before this date, before this hour, before this time. Pressure. Unless we establish a priority time with God, we cannot do it. We cannot even absorb, we cannot even begin to understand how to do it. He has to be our wisdom in this. He has to be our understanding. He has to be our illumination. He has to be the guiding force of our life. On somebody's church roll, quite a lot of us. I don't want this to be a depressive. I don't want this to be a depressive. A lot of the facts and statistics that I've given you are convicting. They're convicting. See the beautiful aspect of our relationship with God. When He brings conviction, He brings solution. He brings solution. He does not leave us We have to be courageous. It's going to take courage, perhaps, for some of you to realign. They do shift. They'll change from time to time. Except for number one. Our relationship with him absolutely simple. Let's pray. God, we are your daughters. We love you. We desire to please you. We desire to serve you. We desire to represent you effectively in the generation in which we live. In and all by ourselves, we can't do this. We have to have your strength. We have to have the uh, guidance of the Holy Spirit to direct us, to show us the path that's right for us. God, um, deal with us, show us, convict us, convince us, God. Bring us to a place of repentance, of turning around and beginning again with a corrected list of colors. We desire to please you. We are your daughters. You are our Father. Help us, Father, to bring into order our lives so that we might bring joy to your heart and benefit to your body, which is our prayer.